for uh, one minute, uh, please, uh, please let's get started. We're looking at uh, one-dimensional WKD theories, and we want to solve the shortening equation in one dimension, pretty simple equation, with some energy D, so we're looking at energy I these days. Uh, if you imagine the potential as a scale, which I call capital L, I've kind of sketched here what that means. Uh, we're interested in the situation in which the Bernoulli wavelength of the wave function, which we call lambda, is much less than the scale. In fact, that's the condition of validity for the WKD theory is that lambda be much less than L. The uh, lambda, of course, is related to the uh, to the momentum by the Bernoulli relation. It's two pi h bar divided by t. If I use the Bernoulli relation, then one can say that the lambda is small if h bar is small. And the frequency of WKD approximation is described by saying that the value of the bar is small. It isn't really dimensionally correct to say that. If you want to put it in dimensionally correct language, you should say that the wavelength is much less than the scale of the potential. Nevertheless, the WKD expansion is, in a sense, a formal power series expansion of powers of H bar. Now, the looking at this, uh, oh, by the way, the momentum that comes from the de Broglie, de Broglie relation is now a function of position because the wavelength of this wave actually changes as you move around. And uh, we need to interpret what this momentum function is. That's something to uh, pay attention to. In any case, this leads by looking at a picture like this. This leads to the WKD onsatz of the wave function, which is that it's a slowly varying amplitude of the rapidly varying phase. Slowly varying means varying in the scale length of the potential, as you see by this amplitude I've drawn here. Uh, and rapidly varying phase means that in a short change in x, the phase undergoes uh, some uh, several oscillations. In fact, in a single wavelength, which is regarded as a short length here, the phase changes by, of course, by 2 pi. Uh, if you think of h bar as being small, the, rapid, the rapidly varying phase is achieved by the fact that since you've got this h bar in the denominator here, the small change in s produces a large change in the phase. In any case, by requiring that the change in s be equal to 2 pi, when delta x equals lambda, at the end of the hour last time, we derived this relation that said that s prime of x, the derivative of the function that appears in the phase, is equal to this momentum function, p of x, that comes from the de Broglie relation. Now pay attention to this function, p of x, because it's being defined here in terms of the local de Broglie relation of the wavelength of the quantum wave. But it also has a classical interpretation, which is going to come out in a minute. So these, these two things will be connected together. This also, as I said, the derivative of s. All right, so I think that takes us up to where we were at the end of the hour last time. Now, this WKB onsatz, so I mean, the, the name of the next step is to use this WKB onsatz, in effect, plug it in the Schrodinger equation, and get equations for both A and S, and then we've got the solution in this approximation. Uh, the WKB onsatz by itself is not, a, uh, is not a systematic expansion in powers of H bar. It's rather just uh, something we wrote down by intuition by looking at a picture like this. However, we can put it into the form of a systematic expansion, which I think clarifies the structure of the theory uh, in the following way. First of all, let me just rewrite the WKD onsatz by bringing the amplitude A up into the exponent. So I'll write it as e to the i over h bar times x of x uh, plus the logarithm of A. That's no change, of course. Uh, but when we do this, you can notice that when Mel appears in the exponent, it's starting to look like a power series and expansions in the powers of h bar. Those, so the first term has, uh, goes as h bar to the minus 1, and the second term goes as h bar to the 0. And so what this suggests is that if we replace this by a systematic expansion that looks like this, e to the i over h bar times the series, which I'll write up this way, is let's say w is 0 at lowest order, plus h bar times w1 of x, plus h bar squared times w2 of x, uh, plus dot, 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 like this. Uh, so if we replace the wave function psi by this expansion in the exponent, you can see the idea is, is that we're making a power series expansion of the logarithm of the wave function uh, in powers of h bar, uh, where we're thinking of h bar as being small. Now, um, why don't we expand the wave function itself? If you're going to study the semi-classical limit, you think h bar is small, you want to expand psi to powers of h bar. The answer is that when h bar goes to zero, if you hold classical quantities fixed, psi does not approach a limit at all. Instead, it just starts oscillating more and more rapidly because of the void wave function gets shorter and shorter. So it's not suitable to expand psi in powers of h bar. But it's 
Instead, we're going to expand the logarithm of psi, factoring out one over h bar, which is what takes care of the rapid oscillations. So in any case, this is what we get in a, a systematic expansion. Let me just call this entire exponent, let me just call it w of x like this, uh, in effect relating psi to its, its log w uh, in this manner. So I'll copy it again here to say so, uh, psi of x is equal to e to the i over h bar times w of x. This becomes a definition of w now. So the next step, what I want to do is to take this version of psi and plug it into the Schrodinger equation and get an equation for w. Oh, by the way, maybe before I do that, let's notice in comparing this series here, so w0 is the same as s. So let's write that down. w0 of x is the same as s of x. It's just another notation for it. And w1 is, is, is equal to the logarithm of a, except I have to multiply by i's. So w1 of x is equal to, as you'll see, minus i times the logarithm of a. And then there's higher order corrections, too, which were actually were further refinements on the uh, on the original WKD Renaissance. All right, so to get back to uh, uh, where it was just a moment ago, let's take this expression for psi and plug it into the Schrodinger equation. We have to evaluate the kinetic energy term, the second derivative of psi, so let's start taking derivatives. Psi prime, you see, is equal to i over h bar times w prime multiplied times psi, first derivative. Take the second derivative, psi double prime is equal to, first I differentiate the w, so I get i over h bar w double prime times psi. And then differentiate psi brings down another factor of i over h bar times w prime, so we get minus 1 over h bar squared times w prime squared times psi. And uh, if it will allow me to do a bad thing, which is to use my eraser here, I'll just factor out the common factor of psi in both these terms and write it like that. All right, so that's just algebra. Now, if I pl plug this uh, psi double prime into the Schrodinger equation, since you now see psi double prime is proportional to psi, and the potential energy term is also, and the total energy are also both proportional to psi, when I make the substitution, the psi's cancel from all three terms. And so what's left over is this, and it's minus h bar squared over 2m times this coefficient in the round brackets. I'll reverse the order of the terms. Minus 1 over h bar squared, w, double, w prime squared, uh, plus i over h bar times w double prime. And then have the other two terms, which is the potential energy v of x is equal to e. And this is, uh, this is what we get. And um, let me now uh, just clean this up, multiply through by minus h bar squared over 2m. And what we get then is, is that 1 over 2m times w prime squared uh, minus i h bar over 2m times w double prime plus v of x minus e, or excuse me, is equal to e, like this. And I'll put a box around this because it's a useful intermediate step to look at. Um, this is the Schrodinger equation, which has been transformed from psi into its logarithm. But in fact, there's no approximation at this point. It's exactly equivalent to the original Schrodinger equation. However, what I will do now is to, uh, is to substitute this expansion in for the w's here. So this becomes 1 over 2m, and then for w prime, it becomes w0 prime plus h bar times w1 prime plus dot 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 quantity squared, that's for the first term here. Then we get minus i h bar over 2m times w double prime, which is the same as w0 double prime plus h bar w1 double prime plus dot 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 plus potential energy v of x equals e. Well, now what we want to do is to, uh, is to take this series and uh, to, uh, uh, and to uh, collect it order by order in powers of h bar. Uh, so h bar to the zero power, which is the leading term, as you see, we just take the value zero prime here, which is squared. So the first term is 1 over 2m times w zero prime squared. And then uh, the next term is already order h bar, so it doesn't contribute to h bar to the zero. And then there's potential in the potential in the energy E, which don't depend on h bar, so this becomes plus <coughs> V of X is equal to E. 
and take back the soft level, that's the h bar equals zero, so you can see the equation there. So this is the lowest order equation we get. Now, at first order in h bar, we'll go, to, we'll go to the first two orders in this. At first order in h bar, there's a cross term here by multiplying these two terms together because it's being squared. So I get 2w0 prime times h bar times w1 prime divided by 2m. So this gives me 1 over m times w0 prime times w1 prime. Over here, like, I do get a order h bar term from the w0 double prime. So it becomes minus i over 2m times w0 double prime. And then b and e don't contribute to h order h bar, so the whole thing is equal to 0. And this is the beginning of a hierarchy of equations. I'll stop there, but if you were motivated, you can go on the second order and create another equation. Uh, and uh, observe the general structure of these equations. Is the, the first one is an equation for w0 alone. It doesn't involve it in higher order terms. Uh, and if you solve this for w0, then you can plug that into the second equation here and here. And then you get an effective equation for w1. And likewise, if you go to the next order, you plug in W, so you solve this one for W1. Then you go to the next order, you can plug W0, W1, and you get an equation for W2, and so on. It's a hierarchy that goes on this way, and you can solve it order by order. We're only going to be interested in the first two orders. Now, um, uh, let's uh, take these uh, equations here in terms of W0 and W1, and let's put them back in terms of the amplitude and phase of the original WKV onslaughts. So for the first equation, that's easy. It becomes 1 over 2m times s uh, prime squared uh, plus v of x is equal to e. And for the second equation, uh, let me do some algebra on that. Uh, first of all, the m will cancel, as you see here. Uh, so the w0 prime becomes s prime. The w1 prime, since w1 is minus i log a, this becomes minus i times a prime divided by a. And then the second term is minus i uh, times s double prime. And that whole thing is equal to 0. Because w is 0 is s. So it's minus i s w prime equals 2. s double prime equals 0. And you change the two minus i's to a plus. You cancel the i's. So they go away. And this can be written now as uh, a prime over a times s plus one half s double prime equals zero. And since I'm sort of running out of room, let me carry it on over here. And if I take this equation, and let's multiply it times twice a squared, which cleans it up, then the first term becomes 2a a prime times s, this should be s prime, the second term becomes a squared s double prime equals zero. This in turn is an exact derivative on the left hand side. In fact, it can be written as dx of the quantity a squared times s prime equals to zero. And that's the most convenient way of writing the first order equation after we've converted back into these s and a variables. So over here in this box, then, is the version of the equations that I want for the, for the function s and the function a, which are the two functions of the amplitude and the phase, which occur in the WK ensembles. All right. Now, I really started writing on the wrong board here this morning, so I'm afraid I have to cover this up. But I will uh, write out for you these two equations once again. And here they are. The first equation of order h bar to the zero was this. It's 1 over 2m s prime squared plus d of x equals e. And the order h bar to the first equation is uh, is uh, uh, dx uh, h squared times s prime of x equals zero. But pretty simple equations actually. The first equation is, is actually a version of the uh, so-called hamilton jacobi equation, which has a long history in classical mechanics that goes way back before the invention of quantum mechanics, so 1830s, 1840s. Second equation is sometimes called an amplitude transport equation, and that's what I'll call it uh, just to give it a name. 
So we need to solve these two equations. <coughs> All right. Now, um, now uh, let's uh, we need to solve the let's solve the let's solve the Hamilton Jacobi equation first. Obviously, the way to do that is to this is s prime, not s twelve, s prime squared. Obviously, the way to do this is to solve algebraically for s prime. And if we do, we find that s prime of x is equal to plus or minus, just bring the two of them across and take the square root, plus and minus the square root of twice the mass times the energy E minus V of x, like this. Uh, let's just take the plus sign on this for now, and we'll worry about the minus solution later on. Uh, I'll remind you from the previous board that we figured out that S prime of X was the momentum, which was the momentum determined by the bulk of the Broglie wavelength. If we take that as this function, definition of this function P of X, what we now see is, is that we have a little additional information now as we see what we have a formula for P of X for that De Broglie wavelength, local De Broglie wavelength of the WKB wave function. What does it mean? However, let's get an interpretation of it. In order to do that, let me take an example. Uh, let's suppose we have a potential energy that looks like this. Still a one-dimensional problem. Let's suppose the potential is essentially zero for large negative x. But then as we move in the region of positive x, it rises up, like going up to a mountain. And uh, let's say it stays up forever, so there's no possibility of anything through this mountain. And uh, let's suppose there is an energy E which looks like this. Now, the energy E that I want to talk about is the energy that appears in the Hamilton Jacobi equation. And actually, that energy is the same as the energy eigenvalue in the original Schrodinger equation. That's where that came from. And uh, so, but, 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 uh, but in, a, in a picture with a potential, it looks like this. Now, classically, a particle coming in from negative x would, it, would originally be a free particle because the potential is zero. This is the V of x curve here. But as it comes in, it starts to feel the potential and slows down and reaches, uh, it comes to a standstill when the, when the uh, energy is, the kinetic energy is zero, which is right here. This is the classical turning point, which I'll call XTG. And then, of course, it reverses and comes back. If I take some x, x value, some typical x value here like this, and you can see the particle passes this point x twice, once going in the forward direction and once going in the backward direction. And the magnitude of the velocity, of course, is the same in both cases, but the sign has changed going back and forth. <coughs> now, on the same scale, allow me to make a, a phase phase, a phase, phase <coughs> of classical phase space, position momentum phase space. And let me bring this x turning point down here also to the lower graph. This, so this is still XTV. The orbit in phase space of large negative x is a straight line and a constant momentum because the particle is really free. So the momentum is constant and it just keeps moving forward in x. However, when it starts to get to where the potential is active, it slows down so the momentum goes down like this and then it goes right through momentum equals zero at the turning point and then turns around and I sketch this well and comes back out like this. So the orbit in phase space is a picture that looks like this. It's kind of a new thing. This is really a scattering problem. It's a one-dimensional scattering problem off of an impenetrable barrier. Likewise, if I take this, this, x, this typical x value here and bring this dotted line down like this, and again, here's some, some typical x value, what you see once again is that the velocity, the, excuse me, the particle passes this x point uh, twice, once going in, where the momentum is positive, and once going back out when the momentum is negative, like this. Now, this curve in phase space, what is, the, what is the equation of this curve? The answer is it's just given by conservation of energy. If we write down the total energy of the system, which is p squared over 2m plus v of x, this is now a classical energy. And set it equal to the total energy, which of course is conserved, then you get an equation for a curve in the xp plane, and it has to be the orbit. The orbit is just the plot of a curve, which you get by setting the classical Hamiltonian equal to the energy. And in particular, this allows us to solve for the momentum values that correspond to a given x position. And that momentum, just solve this equation for p, and that momentum gives us 
P is a function of position, as you see, and it's the square root of twice uh, the mass times the energy minus V of X from the Hamiltonian. Well, that agrees with the same P of X that came out of solving the Hamilton-Jacobi equation from the WKB approximation. So the local momentum connected with the local de Broglie wavelength with the WKB wave function is exactly the same as the momentum of a classical particle, which is uh, moving on the given potential, with two sides plus and minus. So that's the interpretation of this function P of X. And you can see now, right away, that the, that the de Broglie wavelength is going to be uh, shorter, where the momentum is higher, where the velocity is higher, and it'll be longer as the particle slows down. I didn't exactly sketch that very well on this, on this diagram, but it would mean that as the as we uh, as we rise up in the potential, so the velocity decreases, this wavelength is going to get longer down here in this lambda. All right. Now, uh, so that's the interpretation of this function p of x, which is also s prime of x. And so now the solution for S of, S of X is easy. It's just an integral with an upper limit of X of P of X prime DX prime. But to be a little more explicit, is with an upper limit of X of the square root twice the mass energy minus P of X prime uh, and, uh, times at DX prime, like this. What about the lower limit of this integral? The lower limit of the integral is nothing but a constant of integration of the, of the, of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. You can, you can set it equal to anything you want because it's a constant of integration. Let me just call it x0. Uh, you can see that if you change x0 to something else, x0 prime, all it's going to do is just add a constant to s. And since s is the phase of the wave function, let me write the WKB onslaughts down again so that you have here on this board. If I change the phase S by a constant, actually the phase is S over H bar, but if I change S by a constant, you can see it amounts to just changing the phase of the wave function. So this lower limit X is related to the phase convention for the solution. And uh, right now let's worry about phase conventions later so we can set this X zero to anything that is convenient. Anyway, that's just the meaning of that, of that, lower, of that lower limit. There's also a geometrical meaning now. If I take x0, let's say, over here, just to choose some value for it, and s of x is the integral of this p function between x, x0 and x, which is to say this is area here. So the area here, the area here under the classical curve is the same thing as this function of s of x. What I'm saying is a class of particle moves along. You can visualize it as it carries a little integrator with it, and it integrates p dx. And as it does so, what is accumulating is this function s of x, which is divided by h bar as the phase of the quantum wave function. So you can imagine that it's also creating oscillations going up and down as it moves along. That's the way of thinking about the solution. Now, um, now, uh, uh, now, I'd like to uh, shift attention now to the, uh, the quantum interpretation, but with this WKD onslaught, uh, in particular to examine the probability density and probability current. Uh, this is only a one-dimensional problem, so the current is just a, a, it's a scalar only a vector of one component. But if we use the definitions we've talked about before, the probability of density is the square of psi, and the probability current, which I'll call j, I'll remind you, is the real part of psi star. And then you have the velocity operator, which is minus i h bar over mass m acting on psi. This is the definitions we gave. Oh, excuse me. It's minus h bar over m times the derivative d dx acting on psi. <coughs> This would have been a gradient in three dimensions, but since this is a one view problem, these are the definitions we have. <coughs> now, if I take the WK of the onsots, this is only an approximation, remember, but in, in this approximation, let's take this and plug it in here and see what we get. Well, you can see right away that rho is just equal to the square of the amplitude. That's assuming that S is real, but S is real, as you see up here in, 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 these, in these pictures that I've sketched. 
Um, and uh, so that's easy. It's just a squared is just the square of the wave function. What about j? Well, that's equal to the real part of uh, here. I'll, I'll do it, fill it out for you. Psi star is equal to the amplitude times e to the minus i s over h bar. And then we have minus i h bar over m, which is a constant. And then we have ddx applied to psi, which is way up there. There's two terms. One comes from differentiating a and the other one from the exponent. So one term is, gives us an a prime. And the next term gives us a plus uh, i times a times s prime over h bar. And this is all multiplied times e to the i s over h bar. And I close all of that. So this is just a, doing the algebra of calculating j. Now, this term i here times the amplitude a, as you can see, is purely imaginary. And this term here times that second term that has an i in it, it's now got a minus i times a plus i, so this is purely real. Well, the result is this a prime term goes away because we're taking the real part. And what's left over is, is that this turns into an a squared, which takes care of that a and that a there. Uh, the phase here and here, two phases cancel out as a complex conjugates. Uh, minus i times plus i cancel. There's a 1 over m. The h bars cancel. So what's left over is just s prime divided by m. Okay. However, we decided that s prime was the same thing as this momentum function p of x, which we, not, we have an interpretation for up here. And this is divided by m. Let's call p of x, let's call it a velocity. Let's call it v of x. So it's a logical definition here. P is the momentum of the particle. I can't reach it. I'll just say V of X is P of X over M. So this is just the velocity of the particle at a given X position. Really one of the two velocities because there's plus and minus for the particle going in both directions. Let's take this to be the positive velocity. And so to summarize, then we get j rho is equal to a squared, and we get j is equal to a squared times the velocity v, which is a function of x, like this. Okay, so in the WKD approximation, these are the quantum density and current. Now these have to satisfy a continuity equation. This is the continuity equation, which uh, we talked about in the last hour, I believe. Except in one dimension, instead of a divergence, it's just going to be an ordinary derivative. So, well, it's going to be partial derivative. Partial with j with respect to x equals zero. So this is the one-dimensional continuity equation. <coughs> However, nothing here depends on time. Everything's rho, for example, is just a function of position. That's because the original Schrodinger equation we're looking at is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So we're really interested in, in, in stationary solutions. So this term goes away, and so the continuity equation just turns into the derivative of j. In fact, we might as well call it an ordinary derivative since there is no time derivative anymore. And so the continuity equation reduces just, just dj dx is equal to zero. However, j is a squared times v, so this becomes d dx of a squared times v of x is equal to zero. And apart from the factor of one over m, you'll see, lo and behold, somewhere here, Yes, up here, and that's the amplitude transport equation. So the meaning of the amplitude transport equation is conservation of probability. It's the continuity equation for that. Right. Given that uh, fact, uh, so this is so now now we have an interpretation for both of these equations, um, and also for the, the function. Well, we have an interpretation for S in terms of the classical mechanics. What about an interpretation for A? Uh, let me address that question next. Um, let's say a classical interpretation. Uh, it works like this. To be specific, let's take the case of an oscillator. Suppose I have an oscillator like this, and in phase space, this is the orbit, so the particle is going around and around in circles like this. The topological circle. For a harmonic oscillator, this is an ellipse, but for other oscillators, nonlinear oscillators, it will be deformed and look like an egg or something, but topologically, it's a circle. Now, let's take uh, some small interval dx like this. 
Oh, and by the way, let's let capital T here equal the period of the oscillator. A lot of time it takes for the classical part of, part of it to go around. And let's define, uh, let's define a, 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 I'll call it a classical probability density, which is a function of x. And it's defined this way. We'll say the classical probability at x times dx, which is a small interval. This, of course, is the probability of finding the particle in this small interval. Let's declare that this is equal to the amount of time dt, which the particle spends in this small interval, divided by the total period. It's just the fraction of time that the particle spends in that small interval. Then if we do this, this, is, this clearly is normalized to 1 around the oscillator. Uh, one slight thing to change, however, is the question of the interpretation of dt. The total time the particle spends in this interval is a dt from 1 above and a dt from 1 below. So this dt really stands for the sum of those two small time in intervals. Uh, it might be preferable to let dt st stand for the time that it takes the particle to cross the small interval on just one of these two crossings. And if we do that, we want to put a factor of 2 here to double, to double that. And then this then, with that new interpretation of dt, this becomes the classical expression. Now, we can then solve for the world classical of x explicitly. It becomes 2 divided by the total period times dt divided by dx, which is equal to 2 over the period times 1 over the velocity. Now, why is that interesting? It's because it agrees with the solution of the amplitude transport equation. Here it is. Here's the amplitude transport equation. It really came from the continuity equation. Since d dx of this thing is equal to 0, it says that a squared times the velocity d of x is equal to a constant. However, a squared is a quantum probability. And so plugging this in, you see the quantum probability rho of x is equal to a constant divided by the velocity d of x. And so it agrees with this classical calculation. This quantum probability density in, in the semi-classical interpretation is the fraction of time which a particle spends, well, times dx is a fraction of time the particle spends in that interval dx. Here it's explicitly normalized to unity for the case of an oscillator. If we had a scattering problem, which is the kind of thing I have in the upper board here, I don't even need to draw it again where the orbit goes out to infinity, then in that case, it's not possible to normalize the, uh, the classical probability distribution because the time, the period, there is no period, t goes to infinity. But it's still possible to talk about a classical density, which is just now not normalized. We can just, in this case, we can just say the classical density is equal to some constant uh, divided by the velocity v of x. And this is, in fact, precisely what we get from the solution of the amplitude transport. So this then gives an interpretation of the, a classical interpretation of the amplitude A in terms of particle densities. By the way, there's a consequence of this result. This now becomes the same thing as the quantum row you see. Classical row and quantum row are the same. The consequence of this result is that when the uh, velocity gets low, uh, the density gets high. In the case of this oscillator here, if I plot Again, this has now has two turning points. Let me plot rho classical as a function of x for this oscillator. It looks like this. It actually goes to infinity as the velocity goes to zero at the turning points. You'll find, classically, this is still normalizable. The aerial area of the curves is finite, but nevertheless, there's a divergence in the classical, uh, classical density. Here's another way of thinking about this classical density. So imagine that we populate this orbit with classical particles in such a way that individual particles are separated by the same amount of elapsed time. Uh, you see each particle is following an orbit. It's the same orbit, but they're just displaced. They're just in pl different places along the orbit, so they're all moving around the orbit at the same time. When I say they're displaced by a certain amount of, 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 of a fixed amount of time, there's some delta t here. And the idea is that after delta t, each particle moves into the position of the next particle. If you think of delta t getting smaller and smaller, so there's a higher and higher density of particles, then the particles are all moving, but they're moving in such a way that the density of particles that they create is constant in time. 
So one can say that it's a, an ensemble of classical particles, which is uh, whose density is stationary in time. And that's what's appearing in the solution of the of the of the, of the, of the, of the eigenvalue equation stationary state problem in quantum mechanics. All right. Um, the uh, particles pile up here at the turning points because you see there's they don't pile up in the orbit in phase space, but they pile up in the density in the x space because they're getting projected down like this. And there's the slope of this curve is coming down. That's the reason for that. Okay. So most of what I've been saying here has to do with classical interpretations of the solutions of these two equations, the hamilton jacobi and amplitude transport equations. It's actually easy to solve the equations. It's just a matter of, uh, of interpreting them and knowing what they mean. Right. Now, uh, so, uh, <coughs> Conveniently have these two equations still here. So. so to uh, summarize the solution, then we've got s prime of x is equal to p of x is equal to the square root of two m times e minus v of x. So s of x is the integral of that. The limit x of p of x prime dx prime, like this to some lower limit. And as far as the amplitude transport equation is concerned, it says that a squared is 1 over 1 over x prime, 1 over the momentum. So a of x is equal to 1 over the square root of the momentum p of x times a constant here, like this. And that's the solution for the amplitude transport equation. If I factor a mass out, a square root of mass out of the constant, it converts this momentum into a velocity and takes it back to these, these classical densities that I'm talking about up here. This constant that appears here is just a constant of integration of the amplitude transport equation, and you can see that it also is just related to the uh, normalization of the, quantum, of the quantum wave function, which you can uh, sort of lost it. And the WKB onslaught system is the amplitude times the phase. Uh, and so, uh, obviously, a constant of multiplying a is just an overall multiplicate of a constant on the side. So we can, and, and likewise, as I said, x0 is related to the, the phase of the wave function. We can worry about normalization and phase later, so these two constants we can set to something which is convenient at a later point. <coughs> All right, <coughs> now then, this means, uh, this means that uh, if I, uh, let me go. Let me go back to this case of the. Let me just go back to this case of the of the scattering problem where the potential rises like this. Uh, here's an energy E. <coughs> here's the turning point. Sketch it again. Here's the turning point. Here's x P. Here's the phase space orbit coming down like this, going in and out. All right. So uh, this is the uh, this is the solution for A and S here. Uh, there's a couple of things that I need to uh, a couple of minor points I need to pay attention to. One is is that in solving the amplitude transport equation, there were really two solutions for S prime having to do with a plus or minus on the square root, and I just took one of the two solutions from writing these these equations down. But the other other one is in there, and it's just it just has the opposite sign. So s is equal to plus or minus the integral of the of two solutions. The result is we actually get two solutions of the WKD equation. So if I write psi of x out explicitly, there's an amplitude for about uh, one of them is one over the square root of p of x. I'll set just one here for this constant, and this is multiplied times e to the i over h bar s of x. Uh, but there's another solution, which is 1 over the square root of p of x times e to the minus i over h bar s of x. There's really two linearly independent solutions. This, of course, is what we'd expect because the Schrodinger equation is second order and has two linearly independent solutions. So the general solution is going to be a linear combination of these two. Now, in one of these solutions, the function s is increasing as I move to the right because it's the area under the curve. 
So the phase is increasing as we move to the right, and that corresponds to a wave which is traveling in forward direction, just like the positive momentum. Whereas the second term, S is, is de the phase is decreasing as X increases, which means there's a wave here which is moving in the other direction. And so the linear combination is a linear combination of forward and backward going waves, which correspond to the two particles which are crossing a given X position, like this. If you think of this as just in terms of one particle, you don't see it because you see a positive velocity at one point and later a negative velocity. But think about this curve as being populated by a whole ensemble of classical particles. And then there's always one particle above and one particle below, and their phases are, are, the, uh, are, 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 are increasing in opposite directions. Uh, here's something I meant to say a moment ago. Uh, the, uh, uh, the WKD theory uh, expresses, uh, in, in an approximation, expresses the solution of the quantum problem in classical terms. But uh, physical interpretation of quantum mechanics, of course, is very different from classical mechanics. And in particular, quantum mechanics is statistical, fundamentally, and cla classical mechanics is not. So how does, the, uh, how does this very different physical interpretation come about in this approximation? That's one of the questions to ask when we start this business. And uh, we can already see part of the answer to that is that the uh, statistical uh, aspects of the quantum solution is contained in this classical ensemble of particles that are orbiting around and around this orbit. Or in the case of an oscillator, there's an infinite number of coming in, scattering, and going back out again. It's not a single classical particle, but a whole ensemble of them. They all, however, have the same energy because they all lie in the same orbit of the fixed energy. All right. In any case, these two solutions, one is moving to the right and one is moving to the left. So let me give this a coefficient I'll call CR, and this one a coefficient I'll call CL, where R and L just stand for right and left going waves. And if we have this, then this is the solution. Uh, uh, this is the WKB solution uh, uh, that, that we get. <coughs> All right. Now, there's another point that I've been, uh, that I've been omitting up to, up to this point, which is that these solutions that I've worked out here actually only apply in the classically allowed region. In this diagram here, for example, the classically allowed region, C-A-R, let's call it, uh, is the region which is to the left of the turning point. This is where the actual particles are moving. Uh, but there's also a classically forbidden region that's called a CFR, which is over to the other side, and this is where there are no classical particles. There may not be any classical particles over there, but there are solutions of the Hamilton-Jacobian amplitude transport equation. In a classically allowed region, the energy is greater than the potential energy. That's really the definition of that. Whereas the classically forbidden region is one where the energy is less than the potential energy. That means that in the classically forbidden region, you would say the kinetic energy is negative, which would mean the momentum is imaginary. Uh, that doesn't have any meaning in classical mechanics, but it does have meaning for solving these quantum equations. And so in the classically forbidden region, uh, what's going to happen is this quantity here is negative. So this little box here, let me just say that, that this box that I've got here applied in the classically allowed region, and let's write down some things that would apply in the classically forbidden region. Let's just do it this way. So in the classically forbidden region, let's define this. Let's write P of X. P of X now has to be purely imaginary. Let's write it as I times the square root of 2M times P of X minus E. This is just a way of defining one of the two, uh, the two uh, solutions, plus and minus, for the function P of X. And let's define a, 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 an integral called K of X, which is an integral with some upper limit. And it would be the, uh, the integral of the absolute value of p of x prime dx prime, which is the same thing as the integral with an upper limit x and some lower limit of the square root of twice the mass times potential v of x minus e d of x prime minus e dx prime. Okay? And if we do this, then s of x. Uh, which is uh, s of x is equal to, uh, excuse me, i s of x is equal to minus k of x. So
So over here in the class, so this solution I wrote down in the plot with this board is for the class of lab region. In the class of the region, we can say this, that psi of x is going to be a linear combination of a term which is 1 over the square root of all minus absolute value of the momentum to make it real. And then we get e to the k of x over h bar. And then another solution is 1 over the square root of the absolute value of p of x times e to the minus k of x over h bar in the class of the forbidden region. There again are two linearly independent solutions. Uh, k is increasing with x. And so the term that has e to the k of x over h bar is a term which is diverging exponentially as you move in the positive x direction. So let's call this Cg, where g stands for growing. And the minus sign is a solution which is decaying exponentially as you move to the right. So let's call this damping solution Cd, growing and damping solutions as you move to the right. And the result of this is that we have, uh, we have now the uh, two solutions here uh, in the classically allowed and classically forbidden regions. All right, now, to proceed with this, uh, let's take the case, as I've sketched it here, exactly as already sketched, in which the classically allowed region is to the left of the turning point and the classically, and the classically forbidden region is to the right. We can also call these regions one and two of the right. That might be useful. And let's do it this way. In the classically allowed region one, which I put over here in this box, let's make the lower limit of integration. Let's make it the turning point, which I'll call, instead of XTP, let me call it XR, where R stands for right. It means the right turning point. So let's call it XR as the right turning point. And let's integrate S from as I mentioned, any lower limit can be chosen. It's equivalent to a phase convention for the wave function. So let's just make it the turning point. It's the obvious place to choose. Anyway, then that gives us a definite, a definite definition for S of X. And likewise, in the classically forbidden region, let's take the low, lower limit here to be XR. That means that both K and capital S vanish exactly at the turning point. Um, and uh, so those are definite conventions for that. Uh, uh, all right, so, so then uh, now what we have then is, uh, is a, a definite functions here with unknown coefficients, actually two, four definite functions and, and, and four unknown coefficients when right, applying in two different regions. Uh, the Schrodinger equation is second order in time, uh, in space, excuse me, second order in space. So it has uh, two linearly independent solutions. And so the general solution of the Schrodinger equation can only involve two arbitrary constants and not four. So there has to be a connection between these four constants, the right and the left, and the growing and the damping constants. They, of course, apply in different regions of space. So what we need is some way of connecting together the solution on the left side with the solution on the right side. These are called connection rules. Now, um, it's not possible to extend the classically allowed solution right up to the turning point and the classically forbidden region right up to the turning point and then matching them there in order to get the connection rules connecting the coefficients. The reason for that is, is that neither one of these solutions is valid in the immediate neighborhood of the turning point. In fact, it can be shown that there is some small region around the turning point where, where both these solutions are invalid. Why is that so? They're invalid there because the momentum, the velocity and the momentum are going to zero at the turning point. But remember that the Debois wavelength is 2 pi h bar divided by the momentum p, so this goes to this actually goes to infinity at the turning point. And the result is that the condition of validity in WKB, which is that the wavelength should be small compared to the scale of the potential, breaks down. So if you look at this more carefully, you can actually estimate what, what size of the region around here uh, the, the uh, formulas that are not valid. I won't go into that, but let's just say that because of this small region around the turning point where neither one of these solutions is valid, 
it's not possible to find the connection coefficients by just bringing them both up to the turning point. It'd be nice if you could, but it doesn't work out that way. So instead, what do we do? What we need is, in fact, is yet a third solution on top of those two. A third solution which is valid in the immediate neighborhood of the turning point. And this is done like this. This, if I sketch my potential again, v of x, right, let's take this case here. Here's our energy E. Here's the turning point right here like this. I'm calling x r now. Let's approximate the potential by a straight line in the neighborhood of the turning point. So let's say here that v of x is approximately equal to v of x at the turning point x r plus x minus x r times v prime of x r. And if we plug that into the Schrodinger equation, it then becomes minus h bar squared over 2n times psi double prime plus this thing, v of x, so it's v of x r. Just copy it, x minus x r times v prime of x r times psi equals e psi. Now, v of x r, however, is equal to is equal to the energy E because that's the definition of the turning point. That's where the energy is equal to the potential. So this term, V of XR, cancels the E term on the other side. And the result is that we get an equation which um, now just has this linear term. This, of course, V prime of XR is a constant here. Just has this linear term multiplying psi, the right-hand side is zero. This equation can be cleaned up and put into a standard form if we do a change in variables. Let's write x equals xr plus a constant a times z. So that z is a new variable, a is a constant here, z is a new variable, which is going to vanish exactly at the turning point, and it will be negative on the left side and it will be positive on the right side, and otherwise it's just x scaled by a certain factor a. So we do a linear transformation in this resulting equation. Now we choose the constant a in order to clean up the equation and get rid of all the uh, all the constants that are in here. And if you do this, you'll find that the nicest choice for a is this. It's h bar squared. Uh, where is it here? Uh, over 2m times v prime evaluated at the turning point to the uh, one third power. And if you make that choice, then the Schrodinger equation becomes this. It becomes d squared psi dz squared minus z times psi is equal to zero. And that state's been cleaned up and all the physical constants disappear. This is one of the standard equations of mathematical physics. You can read about it in books like Abramowitz and Stegman. And it has two solutions, psi of z. One is called the Airy function, ai of z. And the other is called the Airy function, bi of z. And the general solution is a linear combination of these two with coefficients I'll call CA and CB. Now, um, you can look in the books on, uh, standard, on special functions and get all the properties of the area and area functions. But in order to understand what you're reading from a physical standpoint, it helps to have a physical model to, uh, to understand, understand the results. Uh, the way that I've derived the area, this is the area equation, is by using an approximation to the potential, a straight line approximation. Of course, it's possible the potential really is a straight line everywhere, not just at the turning point. It could be like this. For example, if we had a particle in the gravitational field, then v of z, let v of x, let's call it, would be equal to mgx. It would be strictly linear in the position. And so the area and vary functions are the approximate solutions of the WKB approximation in the, in the neighborhood of the turning point of an arbitrary potential. But they're also the exact <coughs> solutions for a particle in a uniform gravitational field, or for that matter, a charged particle in a uniform electric field, which is the same, the same story because it's linear and x. So thinking about the physics of a, of a particle, the quantum mechanics of a particle in a uniform electric or gravitational field, 
helps us to understand the mathematical properties of the area and very functions. And uh, that's where I'll pick up next time. Is that I, um, I of Z or A, I of Z? It's A, I is the name of the function. It's a two-letter name. The I of Z. It's the I of Z. This man got the British astronomer Airy, who lived in the 19th century. And there was nobody named Barry. There is nobody named B I R Y. But they, they got there is Barry, but it's not spelled that way. Uh, for those of you who came to Lancaster, uh, first homework got this book rated in the history.